Thank you that as we are speaking today and, and listening to your word, that the Holy Spirit of which we speak is working in us and through us, bringing us closer and closer to glory. Our Father, now we pray that you would be with Brother Jesse as he leads his discussion and be with each of us as we listen and participate. We pray that you would continue to bless our gathering and fellowship. In Christ's name, amen. amen. One of the uh, things that we like to do with renewal, and a very important part of it, is to have discussions. And we want to encourage all of you that have anything to say or if you have questions to, to come forward and, and say what's on your heart. And uh, we do ask that you come up here, and the reason we don't want to embarrass anyone, but we do want to have your comments and questions on, on tape so that those who aren't able to be here will be able to listen to it and fellowship with us. So we do ask that you come up and, uh, and speak so that you can be heard on the tapes and things. Uh, the way that we do this, Brother Jesse's going to lead us in a discussion, and generally, um, the person that leads the discussion will come forward and present a few thoughts to kind of stir up your minds and get you thinking about things and, and you can feel free to come forward and share your thoughts and also as uh, things go on if you have questions that you would like to ask that's what this is for also uh, you don't you don't have to have questions that are necessarily directly related to um, the subject that brother Jesse brings forward uh, we, it, this is, of course, on the Holy Spirit. Any questions that you have on the Holy Spirit, uh, there's a, a wealth of information in this room. Um, so Brother Jesse doesn't have to answer everything. So. <laughs> He's a little bit nervous about that. So uh, without any further ado, I'll let Brother Jesse speak. I need to pray once more. Father God, I do not want this to be a showcase of human power, of, of uh, fleshly wisdom, dear Lord. I need this to be, and I want this to be a, uh, an opportunity for your spirit to work among us. Dear God, I pray that uh, for my own self that I would not uh, seek this out as pride. I pray that I would not rely upon my own wisdom or upon my own understanding, but I pray that I would open up my mouths and your words would speak through me. I ask, dear God, that I would step aside and join with John the Baptist in saying that you must become greater and I must become less. I ask that you would be with us in our discussion. I pray that uh, wherever you convict us that we would speak however you guide us that we would follow. In your son's holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. As Brother Mike uh, mentioned, this is a discussion. Anything is open. <clears throat> Questions? Speakers who have forgotten things that they were going to say, I open you to, I invite you to uh, <laughs> go ahead and step forward and say whatever you might have left out of your notes. Also for those of you who uh, are in the middle aisles or perhaps uh, don't feel because of children or whatever that uh, you can make it up to the microphone. I do have a wireless so I will come out and in the style of Geraldo ask your questions from the audience. <laughs> so if you have anything to add there is absolutely no restriction that would keep you from encouraging one another. I do however feel that uh, my words will be inadequate uh, as a creature to the creator sort of style. I do have clumsy speech. But something that we're going to be talking about today is the ministry of the Holy Spirit in reaping eternal life. This is not something that uh, was expressed specifically although the uh, undertones were inherent and have been throughout the past uh, few sermons and upcoming sermons as well. One thing that uh, I have noticed throughout these sermons is that I felt like taking a black marker and drawing a line through the things that have already been said. 
In fact, from the very beginning, I, I felt a little aggravation at first because I thought that these thoughts were my own. But it seems that all the speakers, whether uh, we realize this or not, all the speakers have been meeting in the same classroom for the past few months Amen. with the same instructor. And that's why we have the same notes. To begin with, I'd like to just draw your attention. This has already been mentioned several times, but it is by repetition that the human nature grabs hold of things. So we'll say it again. The cooperative nature of the Trinity, though they may be separate, they do work together. You see this from the very beginning, Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2. You have God speaking, you have the Spirit hovering. In John chapter 1, Christ, the Word, Logos, is drawn back to that beginning. In Colossians 1, verse 16, it is said, By whom and for whom all things have been made, and all things hold together. Through Jesus, we see that that unity. Brother Mike and I were talking back at Rachel Powers' open house a few weeks ago, when I was kicking around some ideas of what what it is I was going to talk about. And one thing that we discussed was that there is nothing that they do on their own. They do nothing of their own volition, of their own accord. This is not something that you have a renegade portion of the Trinity. You have some. They are all involved. They are all of the same mind. They have the same desire. And that desire that we're going to be talking about is getting you into heaven. Getting you to achieve that eternal life. At the baptism of Jesus, you have the beginning of Jesus' ministry. You have Jesus coming out of the water, the Spirit coming down from heaven, God's voice being spoken. All three brought together. In atonement, Hebrews 9.14, if I could read this for you. This is from the NIV. How much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God. Amen. Cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. Amen. And in salvation, 1 Peter verse one, or chapter 1, verse 2, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit for obedience to Christ Jesus and sprinkling by his blood. Amen. And 1 Peter 3, verse 18, It says, For Christ died for our sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. In the resurrection, it is attributed to God in Acts chapter 2, verse 32, to Jesus in John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18, to Spirit in Romans 1, uh, verse 4. Amen. It is all three by whom they are raised. It is by all three that we are going to achieve this eternal life. So the point that I want to talk about from that baptismal, or from whichever baptismal you came up from, to eternity, from here, from this point, to over there, what is the ministry of the Holy Spirit? I want to encourage you, no matter what time, if it seems like I'm saying something important, don't worry about it, raise your hand, come up, do whatever you want. If you feel that there is something being placed upon your heart, I want you to share it. I want this to be an open time. Revelation 22, verse 17. I tossed around the idea of this being my key verse. But it's so short. And yet it's so specific. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Brother Dan Brook, where are you? Where are you? Back there? There's your other exclamation point. When he brought up, Oh, wretched man that I am, he said there's an exclamation point right there. Paul goes on to say, who shall save me from this body of the death? But the Spirit says, come. Amen. He's going to save you. He's going to play a part in bringing you and redeeming your life. And let him who hears say, come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. Come. In John chapter 14, Verses 15 and 18, the presence of the Holy Spirit. Christ says, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. 
Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwells within you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. The NIV says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will leave you with a guardian, a comforter. Uh, there has been a lot of points that have been brought up, and I tell you, it's been stewing around in my mind, and I'm probably going to throw them back out sloppily, so I'm just going to try and capture the idea that was behind him. But, but I, I have a terrible memory, so if I attribute something else to someone else, I'm just going to say the Spirit led today. So earlier the Spirit said, and he was talking about being carried, carried alongside of. That caught me. Because so many times we think it's of our own accord. We think it's of our own volition. But when we yield to the Spirit, He carries you. He carries alongside of you. But it's made known. It says here, uh, verse 17, it says, You know Him. You know Him. For He dwells within you and shall be in you. I've been reading a lot lately. Dave has a lot of books for me to read. Uh, <laughs> but one of them, uh, Spurgeon, great, great book that I've been reading. Uh, he says this about the Holy Spirit. Our hope of success and our strength for continuing the service lie in our belief that the Spirit of the Lord rests upon us. He goes on later on in that chapter to say that it is more than just a mere whimsical belief, but it has become a knowledge of the Holy Spirit. And what I, if I could, I'm, I'm going to say this. When a child gazes upon those around him that can walk, and he cannot yet, he believes that he will someday walk. But when he does begin to walk, then he knows that he has that power. He does not presume. In David, when he had encountered sin, he said in that psalm, Do not take your spirit from me. He knew it. He knew it as a fact that he had the Spirit, that there was this presence. It has become more cognizant than just purely conscious. We have, we have known, we have tasted, it has become fat to us. Yes, yes, brother, brother Bill. I'm afraid if I wouldn't first want to say something, by the time everybody else did, I wouldn't have anything to say. Uh, from the baptistry to eternity, right? Paul was writing the church at Corinth, and he says, Therefore, being always of good courage, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be home with the Lord. It seems only logical that... God sending His Spirit to us from heaven, that the Spirit Himself would desire to be united from, so to say, the place of His origin to be home. And if we are indeed united with Him, which we are, then the Spirit would be compelling us to be home. And so to me, that would be a ministry of His to us on this earth. Amen. That Amen. That's a very good point. Very good point. In Romans chapter 8, verse 5, it says, They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. One thing the Spirit makes known when, when you realize that the, the Spirit is in you, you notice what you're thinking about. You notice the things that just repulse you. And you notice the things that tug at your heart. The things that make you cry. The things that make you sing louder and deeper. This brings us to the next point I wanted to sing, uh, talk about was the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. 
Galatians. There are three books mainly that you should probably keep your fingers in. One of them is John, the other one's Romans, and the third one would be Galatians. We'll be jumping around from those three today. Uh, chapter 5, verse 16 through 25. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts after the Spirit, against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other. So that you cannot do the things that you would. It's kind of a clear line drawn of whichever one you feed more is going to win. But if you, lead, if you be led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murdy, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Paul, Paul seems to denote a clear line. Kind of a drawing a line in the dirt and saying, which side do you want? Make no mistake, he didn't combine the two sections. There is no overlapping. There's a clear separation. And he says, fruit, not fruits. Not a possible, you have love but not joy. You have peace, but you don't have long suffering. It's a fruit. It comes out that way. You know, I was thinking about uh, Norma. She's, she's not here. She wasn't feeling too well, but when she was giving her, uh, her testimony the other day, and she was talking about her story things that she had gone through in her life. And as I, uh, as I notice a lot of these meetings, I take out my notes and I scratch something down because I feel inspired to think of something. And I began thinking, we all have our stories. In this room, we could, we could probably take up the rest of the night just with a few people. Things that we used to do, things, people we used to be. I encourage you to know that there is a change. Yes. And something that occurred to me that made me smile was that even yesterday, from today, there was a change. That's the power of the Spirit. You're growing every day. There is a difference from a week ago to today. You're constantly moving forward. Yes, both sides. You're doing so well, I didn't want to interrupt you. You're really summarizing, getting at this. Now, I did forget one point. <laughs> <coughs> that, uh, <coughs> I said, and this is at the heart of this whole matter, Jesus cures the deadly cancer of self, self-rule, resisting obedience, self-interest, resisting sacrifice, and then I was explaining sacrifice and didn't get to the third one. And it's the one we need to pay attention to. He cures the cancer of self-complacency, satisfaction with ourselves and our salvation, not caring about the rest, not feeling the agony and the uh, responsibility of fellowship. We must belong to one another. So often when we make progress in Christ and we get that self-satisfaction, we get a little element of pride and we put down others instead of lifting them up. And that's where we play the devil. We, we, the devil will catch us at any stage in our climb toward the Lord. You see this whole thing, it's not so strange. Life is only from God, he gave us life. But death was brought in by man, expressing himself instead of God. We're redeemed then and restored by return to God through Jesus 
giving himself unto death to rescue us from the condemnation of the law and make it possible for some by faith to be reconciled to God through his sacrifice so that the sentence of God is taken away and reconciled by God by change of heart so that the resistance to God is taken away. And reconciliation is a very important thing. Yes. Uh, a young man that's starting a new church in Lee Summit, Missouri, adjacent to Kansas City, mentioned that he was stressing um, reconciliation and then relationships and then responsibility in building a new church. That was a good thing, but we must get that reconciliation with God. Now, 1 Corinthians talks about God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. It really is an essential thing. I, I just get distressed how many times people that seem to be trained in the Bible and leading in the church come up with the idea that Jesus' death didn't really pay the penalty for our sins. They make it some kind of a moral change. They want again make it humanistic instead of our life is all together from God. Our salvation is all together from God. We just have to be receptive. We just have to be open. We have to be willing. Are you willing to be made willing to let God be God? Amen. Through reconciliation, through giving us a basis of faith by which, and a, an appeal of love and an example of the power of faith, he remakes us. We have to get in a position where he can actually reinvent us, re create us. And in this he cures the deadly cancer of self. But nearly every human being thinks I have a right to myself. It is absolutely false. I don't have a right to my own feet or my own ears or my own head or my own tongue. That right is forfeit. We have earned death. God gives life. Amen. If we'll give up self, that means our instincts that means our basic habits. That means our most defensible qualities. The Apostle Paul counted all that was gained to him be lost, all things but lost, for the sake of the excellency of Jesus Christ instead. And then, wonder of wonders, we give Christ everything and we find we have been given by him the gift of life again. Now, please, brethren, don't resist obedience, submission. When the Bible speaks of Christ submitting to the Father, that's no, that's no subordinate character. That's, that's no... Uh, women today don't want to be in submission to a man because they want to be second class. It takes first class people to be in submission. Amen. That's not resist obedience. But churches resist obedience to their elders. Obedi well, actually, the Bible doesn't ever say elders should rule. Uh, that's mistranslation. The Ephesians 5 20 says all of you be obedient to each other in the fear of Christ now usually they translate that submit to one another there it uses hupotasso the regular word for obey in Hebrews 13 17 it says be persuaded by and listen to the elders but it doesn't say be under their rule the rule of their thumb now um, that's on the side I don't need to go to those things. Never resist sacrifice. Never resist loss. No matter how much loss for the sake of the kingdom of God or for the, the spiritual life of another person, God can make it up to you. Don't worry about it. Never resist fellowship. Never withhold help where you can give it. Never refuse to love. Love wants to give. And when you don't want to give, you've quit loving. Really, it's just terrible the way in the church we see a lack of faith, a lack of hope. Paul prayed that you have the, will, the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know the hope of his calling. You may know the power that he has to transform us. That you may know the riches of the glory of his kingdom, which is his heritage, which is the church. And we just need to, then you know the other. Faith, hope, and what? Love. Now by faith, hope, and love, 
and the church of America today is deficient, lacking faith and in hope. At a state convention in Lansing, Michigan, years ago, I was called to preach on where they signed the subject, tried to preach to a good audience of good Christian people on hope. And they didn't understand. They didn't respond. They, uh, oh, the brother who used to preach so long in Indianapolis, Trinkle, O.A. Trinkle, was the one who got the message and responded to me. It was one of the, this is a responsive audience. I've had more response today from you than from a, con a convention of a thousand people. Some people just don't understand what hope is because we're satisfied with American materialism. Some people just don't know what love is because we've been loving ourselves first and even listening to say in order to love others you have to learn how to love yourself. That's false psychology. Oh. <laughs> Tell you two reasons why the church is not taught about the Holy Spirit because it takes longer than they'll stand for a sermon to be. Uh, it takes the uh, preacher is just afraid to preach on it because you can't do anything but sow confusion in such a short time as they want you to occupy. Second thing is that when you mention this subject, you get more resistance, more emotion, you have more. Um, preconceived notions that won't yield and uh, because people think the Holy Spirit has to be a demonstration of some miraculous performance. The Holy Spirit is usually out of sight and it's not the demonstration of miraculous performance, it's the completeness of a change of person, always in personality. The Holy Spirit is a personality, works in personality. Amen. Yes. You got it. I, I think so. <laughs> yes. yes. This is, uh, I, I hadn't planned on doing this. Now, I have the discussion tomorrow, Jesse. Just don't go too far with this. Brother Bob and I are kind of junior astronomers. Now, I've talked to several of the brethren about this, but I, I want to say this again in view of what we're talking about as spirits. Every one of you have gone out at night, and probably the most of you know what, what Orion's belt is. You've seen this? It looks like a seven, a backward seven, three little stars, and then a little tail comes down. That's a sword hanging down. It's a little cockeyed, but it's like that. The middle star in the sword is the Orion Nebula. Okay. They've always known that that was big. But it is. It's pretty big. Now, with Hubble, they've been able to have a close look and, and be able to put a parsec map up there some kind and determine approximately its size. And the, and the way for us to, to make a measurement that we could understand. If from the Earth to the Sun is one inch, the Orion Nebula, that little furry faint thing, would be 12 miles wide. Now, let me do this again. If from the Earth to the Sun, which is 93 million miles, is one inch, the way to extrapolate this is the width of the nebula would be 12 miles. This, this is nothing more than a single example of the Word of God in its intensity of simple declaration, okay? When God talked about, when the Spirit talks about, records the creation, He says He, great light, bright light in the daytime, lesser light to rule the night. And in passing, He says, create the stars also. That's it. Okay. Now, what I'm telling you, what I'm telling you, Brother Kenny talked about this this morning. For God, last night, whenever you preached, for God so, or thus, loved the world. Listen, create the stars also. He's saying exactly the same thing. The magnitude displayed in this array of stars is on the same scale, methinks, of every promise and every statement in Scripture. 
Now, what the, what the Spirit is doing for us now, over time, we are being transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we can begin to conceive of what change is taking place in us right now. Another thing, Bob and I jokingly talk about this. You brethren talking about just barely touching the hem of the garment. We figure with a good pair of binoculars, we might be able to see the hem of the garment. Okay? This, this is just the beginning. Now, Jess, don't, use, don't go too far with this discussion today. But, because I've got it tomorrow. I want you to, to think like that, though. This, this is what he said. Oh, by the way, and he calls the stars by name. Mm -hmm. Okay. See? And he has their names. He has their names. There are a few tidbits like this in Scripture that begin to open for us somewhat of the work of the Spirit in introducing these concepts. One other little thing. I shared this with the brethren before. Uh, another thing, and I'm just using astronomy as one little thing that, that we can talk about here in, in this room. Uh, another thing they did is there's a very dark place in space. Okay, there's, it's a dark, quiet place. It's usually busy. There's a lot of light. Well, there's a dark place there. They aimed on that with Hubble, and I'm not a Hubble fan necessarily, other than it's an interesting source of information of things that we've known for millennia. They, they aimed at that dark place, and they did a full power axis to axis zoom on the Hubble. And I'm going to have to move here, but see that light switch on the wall by the door right here? 30, I think it was about 30 meters, right up here, there was a target, a one centimeter target. Okay, can you see this penny? This penny is twice the size of the target, but that's about how far the target is away. They did a full power zoom into that target inside that one millimeter dark space, they were able to identify at least 1,500 galaxies. He created the stars also. Brother I'm kind of amazed by that. You would even choose that one because that's one of the two God gave us the names of. Man didn't just choose that one. He didn't even name that one. As long as we're in this vein, I, uh, I still remember the first time I read from C.S. Lewis that time did not contain him, but in him alone does time exist. Mm -hmm. And I thought about that, and I thought some more, and I, I had to stop. I had to put down the book. <laughs> Trying to wrap your brain around something, something like that. When, when, when I was old enough to read the book of Colossians and understand that first chapter, I, I had to put down the book again and, and begin to praise. Uh, it, is, it is something that we, we are but dust. And to be able to think, or to be able to even come to a uh, slight understanding, this dark glass, mm -hmm. it'll, it'll, uh, it'll make you think. It'll keep you speechless is what it'll do. It's what it's doing right now. Transforming I power. Speechless, I have okay. something I can add <laughs> here. Right. Just, a short, just a short parenthesis. What... what uh, Brother Danny just mentioned here a statement of, of John in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 25. And this is the promise which he himself made to us, eternal life. Amen. We're talking about promises, eternal life, a condensation of many things into one. This is the promise, eternal life. Amen. Amen. I remember uh, also sitting in church one time, Brother Gibbon was preaching on heaven. And when the concept hit me of eternal life, I uh, got up from where I was, stopped playing with my toys, and went and sat with my parents. Because it was something that I could not entirely grasp at the moment. It, I, it was, if God had been there, we are used to this beginning. God has no beginning. I'm going to get off this before I get a headache. <laughs> The transforming power of the Holy Spirit. 
in Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions, the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. Amen. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Amen. I, uh, I appreciate this text. Amen. It is the spirit that will bring you along in this way. I'm not going to add any of my own thoughts to that. I'm just going to stop and leave that verse to speak on its own. In Romans 8, 9 through 14, we also hear that there is no obligation to sinful nature, but to Christ. And as Brother Seth, you pointed out last night, that we have no life of our own. And as you just pointed out, we also are entitled to death. And it is this life that is a gift. But one thing that's interesting about Romans 8, 9 through 14 is that the Spirit gives power to crucify the flesh. Yes. Amen. In Ephesians 3, 16, it tells us that it strengthens. In 2 Peter 1, 21, as Brother Phil mentioned today, it teaches. It leads. One thing that I am still amazed at is the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. As the Spirit caught him up. And brought him to Azotus. What's the name of the place? <laughs> Those of you who didn't hear, Brother Seth said that that was the first preacher who was on an airline. In John 16, 14, and 15, as we're beginning the teaching of and revealing of the Holy Spirit. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and show it unto you. That's what this renewal is. And as I mentioned before, there, there's a lot of repetition. And for some people, you, you may get tired of that. There might be a slight overlap in that that's how we learn. And it is, it is through this repetition that we come to a, a revelation. And we are able to be taught. And as I mentioned earlier, we all have the same teacher. We all have the same instructor. Brother Al? If we could backtrack just a minute to the Galatians 5 text that you were commenting on. You know, the, these, these two texts, uh, walk in the Spirit for you, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, and then the fruit of the Spirit, those two items are, those are two items that are talked a lot about in the church world. But, but, I, but a lot of times, and I suppose that's the way I learned them too, you know, you, you kind of just focus on that one thought out of the context. But I want you to see that in both of these things, the, both of these matters were locked in mortal combat. He says, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And it doesn't mean that if it's nice, or if you have time, or if it's convenient. He says, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these two are contrary one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. And then how about there in the, in later on with regard to the fruit of the Spirit, he says, he says, I tell you before that they which do these other things, they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. 
but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. See, so that shows you how vital the fruit of the Spirit is. It's not an option. See, it's not an option. See, it's, you either have it or you're dead. You either have it or you're not accepted with God. See, that's, you either have it or you're not going to heaven. See, that's, I mean, that's what I want. See, you can see how the, the context, the contrasts that are set forth in these contexts. See, that's what I wanted you to think about. Thank you. We're talking about the Holy Spirit and his role in bringing us safely to, to glory. And he does this in a variety of ways. I want to just fasten on one that is particularly precious to me. God's people do need to have a, a lot of information to navigate. They need to know about God. They need to know about the ways of God. They need to know about Christ and the atoning death of Christ and the intercession of Christ. But there's, there's an experience they need also. They need to have a, a, an abounding, dominating hope. Not, not a theoretical hope. Yeah, not a casual hope. A dominating. So that uh, forever being with the Lord is a, was a pre, preeminent quest. Yes. Dominates everything else. Now... The Lord knows that, that, that if you just lay that responsibility upon people, that is exceedingly, uh, an exceedingly difficult thing. You can't just like muster that up in your own energy or sing some peppy choruses that cause it to happen or some old time hymns. That, it, you're going to have to have some divine involvement in this. And so the, this Romans 15, 13 says uh, it's, it's a prayer. But what a, it, it kind of depicts the... The, what this love by the Seth is talking about, what it compelled a person to do. He just sort of abandoned himself for the moment, and he said, May the God of all hope fill you, fill you with joy and peace in believing, so you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so the Holy Spirit has got to have something from God in you to work with. You can't abound in hope till a God of hope fills you. It's hard to go to heaven grumpy. Now let me tell you. <laughs> this joy, this is a joy of salvation. This is the joy, uh, we joy in God. I like that kind of that, old, that older translation because it is arrests my attention. We joy in God. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. A God you have to be close to God for this to happen, but it, it'll happen. God will fill you with joy and peace. <laughs> Even if there's turmoil all about you. Peace. But see, the way you access it is through believing. Well, thank God for that. I'm thankful for that. What if he just said, Joy, if you can walk on water, I'll fill you with joy and peace. I mean, there's an example of people walked on... At least two, Jesus walked, Peter walked for a little bit, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. What, what if he said, if you could part the Red Sea, then I'll give you this. Is he have an example of someone who did this? You could stop the sun and turn it back a few degrees. What if he just said that? What if he said, if you can call locusts uh, down, or if you can bring her in water into blood, or, or what if you can axe head swim, just the small things. If you could do that, then I'll feel you. No, it's through believing, which it puts you in a responsive mode. I thank God for that and I uh, encourage you to, to actually seek that not only for yourself but for your brothers and sisters. It's a lot of, there's a lot of Christians people that need this and they don't even know they need it. I don't know that the Romans knew they needed it. I don't know if they knew. They did after Paul told them what he'd been praying for. Then they knew it. So I, when you pray for these people, tell them you did that. I've been praying that you'd be the God of all hope and fill you with joy and peace and believing so you can abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. I can guarantee it'll bless their soul. Amen. Amen. Take my opportunity for an exit there. Just a few uh, thoughts, perhaps not as uh, coherent as some of the others. And Brother Jesse brought up this matter of the fruit of the Spirit. The uh, first thing that came to me is the fruit of the Spirit. The flesh can poorly emulate it at times. But, it, I mean, it's, it's really uh, an encouragement if you find that in yourself you really do have joy. See, this can't be conjured. That's an evidence that the Spirit of God 
is bearing fruit in you. So really it's an encouragement if you find or you can identify in your own life the fruit of the Spirit. And, and you'll know if you don't have it because you, you might have a pretty good outside but you'll, you'll be hollow. We all know what that hollow feeling is because we had it before we came into Christ. And then talk about that high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And as uh, Brother Rick was speaking this morning, I thought to myself, well now I know that high calling. It's come unto me. You can't get a higher calling than that, to come to God himself. And that's what really he's calling us to, is to himself. And everything is in, else is in order to that. And what a great, what gracious words. It would have been gracious if God had only said, you're free of condemnation. That would have been gracious from our Creator. But he, he went beyond that. There really isn't a word in the language that I'm familiar with to really communicate the, the great giving of himself and the um, love, I suppose, comes as close as any word that we have. But for our Creator, against whom we had sinned so grievously, and I'll make this personal, against whom I had sinned so grievously, that He would say to me, come unto me. Not only do I want you, I'll pay for it. I'll do everything you can't. Just come. What a, you can see now where the sin of unbelief, whenever it says this, this is the sin that condemns people now, is unbelief. Because there's, there's nothing else that can keep you from the Savior. He has made perfect provision, abundant provision for us all. And then there are just a digression. Some of the brethren in Missouri will have will remember this, but that Romans 8, 26 text that our brother mentioned this morning about the Spirit also himself maketh intercession for our infirmities. Because we, there's times when we don't even know how we ought to pray. We have a burden. We, we feel the need to communicate something. It's beyond our ability. All, all we know, all we can do is, is feel the need to bring this to God. We really don't know how to order our cause before God adequately. Now I'll show you the perfection of the salvation and the extent to which God has gone. There is no part of us, there's nothing too deep in us, too, too high or too low. Everything, it's a perfect provision. In those times, the Spirit, who, whom we have been joined to the Lord with, he searches those deep things. He knows. He knows. And then He makes intercession according to the will of God on our behalf. See, and I'm looking forward to that day when I'm going to know even as I am known. Because that's how well God knows me. He can say on my behalf things that I can't even say on my behalf. That's how complete this salvation is. He has left nothing to chance. And then we cannot take hold of eternal things if we would hold to things passing away. You can't do it. If you hold on to what's here, your hands are full. You won't, you won't be able to grasp, as it were, the things of God because they're enmity. See, there has to be commonality in order to facilitate understanding. Um, I've used this example before because it's a good one. I have a little dog, and I think I'm the only person who really loves this little dog. But that's okay, because I love him and I'm the mama. So, but that little dog, if, I, if I'm upset, he can perceive something about something's wrong. But I can't go to that little dog and tell him what my problems are. Because he's a dog, he doesn't understand me. And it, it's a anthropomorphism here of a sort and it's imperfect as most earthly examples but see unless we could be made like God in some way we had no way of understanding what he could say it and we wouldn't understand you don't believe that the devil he was privy to the gospel 
and he still provoked him to kill the Prince of Life. He didn't understand what God was doing. And he's greater in wisdom and in power than we are in our own strength. He, see, because they're not alike. He heard the words. He saw the testimony. And he didn't understand. And we won't either unless through the Spirit we actually partake of the nature of God. This is part of that great provision. It, how unsearchable are, are, are the, is the no, depths of the knowledge of, of God. I'm probably messing this up because I'm nervous. His ways past finding out. I, I can understand why the apostles from time to time, whenever they would be talking about these great truths, would just break out in these great expressions of praise because they saw some of the greatness. And it's, it's going to continue. We can glory in these times together now. But see, this is an upward track. Heaven is always above us. And, and we can just continue to grow in these things. You don't ever have to worry about being bored, like Brother Ricky said, because God is here. <laughs> There are two scriptures be important for you to know right now. Jesus was talking with the Pharisees in John 5, about verse 44. He says, how can you believe when you receive glory one from another and the glory of the only God you seek not? You wonder, how could the Pharisees be so saturated with scripture, so learned and so confident that they knew God and were serving God and be so much hostile to his will? They thought they were something when they were nothing. How can you believe when you receive glory? One from, do we compliment each other? And we should appreciate each other, but let's be careful about being satisfied with that. Amen. And again, in 1 Corinthians 8, Paul says, if anyone imagines that he knows something, he doesn't yet know as he ought to know. Yes. Just thinking you know is a, is a sign that you're kind of ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> have confidence in God faith all there is to religion from our point of view is faith and we got beyond faith when we got confident in our ability to arrange it there was a wonderful story Edwin Hayden told me 40 years ago <clears throat> that one of the Corys Aber Stephen Corey of the famous um, apostasy in the UCMS and, and the International Convention Agencies told this story. The devil was training his henchmen, and one question had, if you saw a man going down the street with a package of pure truth, what would you do? Well, one was going to overpower him. No, you, you can't beat him. He knows what he has. He'll die. You just kill him. I'll buy it from him. No, there's no price he'll take. So on. finally, well, the answer is, just tempt him to organize it. Uh, I was thinking about the abounding in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, and there's something that I, that I saw in that a week ago that was really amazing. One of the conf confirming things that the Holy Spirit does, and what he did in the disciples is, is one of these aspects that the Holy Spirit did, is to disclose the things which are to come, those things which are in the future. And he confirms those things in us. Now, it requires power for that to happen, because just to say, well, yeah, in, in, in the end it's all going to work out. You know, people say that about Revelation. Well, in the end we know it's all going to work out. And They say some of these kind of general relations, they really don't know that. But when the power comes, you, you're convinced of what is to come. Hope abounds. Yeah. And that's what it means when it says the people perish for lack of vision. Because if they can't see a sure future, they can't live confidently now. They can't do it. It's impossible. You've got to abound in hope by the Holy Spirit now, and he does that by confirming what is to come. And if you need a commentary of that, the Thessalonians who are now witnessing right now, what probably to some degree witnessing, I speculate, what's going on here can confirm to you that when Paul told them something that was not revealed before, that when Jesus comes, he will bring with him those who have died in Christ. Boy, that was a source of hope for them. I, I was uh, thinking about what Brother Gene said earlier about one of Brother Seth's classes. 
we're at 20 after 7, he said, Brother Hutchcraft, would you like to join the class? I've, I've been there too, Brother Wilson probably remembers, and, but really I wondered, you know, when the Spirit works with us, I know in my life, He has had to work overtime to get some very simple things through to me. And I was just, just wondering from a purely physical point of view, I wonder sometimes what his response is when we finally catch on to some of these things. If, if there is a response, yeah, finally. It's, I didn't think he was going to. I just wondered about that because he works a lot with us. Brother Dean, I, I saw your hand there. I was afraid I wasn't going to get it. Uh, Brother Dave's message, he, he mentioned... Uh, that we are as Christ. We are born from above and we are born of a natural birth. And I recall, and I was sharing this with Brother Tim, but I recall when that first dawned upon me, you know, I, and this is the Holy Spirit that, that, that teaches you these things. It's the Holy Spirit that causes this to dawn upon you that you are as Christ when He was in this world, as He was, and we are. Uh, totally reliant upon God because Jesus was. See, he, he abode in the bosom of the Father while he was, while he was on, this, on this earth. Well, how, if, we, if we aren't constantly abiding in Christ, how can we, how do we have a, a chance to, to, to escape this, this uh, uh, world? And I uh, was... I remember this dawn of I mean, there's a lot of things I can recall when the Holy Spirit just uh, uh, ministered these things to me, and it was like a light when I it would just it was just astounding. And I remember this, uh, this matter of this in First John here about the anointing. It says, "But the anointing which ye have received of Him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you." But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. That we may have confidence when he, appear, when, he, when he appears at his coming. This is what we're, this is what we're, we're aiming for, have confidence when Christ comes. We, confidence at the time of the uh, judgment day and we do have confidence in Christ but until that time we have confidence in him even now as we're living in this world and that that's the message abide in him abide in him die to the world die to yourself live for him all to him he is our master right? these things are we're, we're not we're not observers of the gospel, we're participants in the gospel. Yeah. And that, that's, that's, a, that's a hard thing for flesh to, to, to grasp. And flesh really doesn't want to grasp it. It has to be that we, and using our kingdom abilities, which we are kings and priests, we, using our kingdom and priestly abilities, then we are to keep this flesh in subjection and glorify God in our flesh. This is... This is and, and, and we, we cause the flesh, we make the, we force the flesh uh, to bow. And, you know, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess, even though those that, someone mentioned this earlier, even those that don't want to confess it now, well, they'll be forced to confess it. Well, we, we can force the flesh now to confess it. And, and, and uh, we want to serve and glorify God in our flesh also. And we can do it under the direction of the Holy Spirit. But the, that's how reliant we are upon the Holy Spirit. But if you walk, you walk in the Spirit, you'll not fulfill the less of the flesh, as Brother I'll just mention. And that is the, that's the conquering power. We have, it's doable. See, and, 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 and we have the power to do it. You talk about Amen. power, this is power. This is real power, the power of the gospel for us. Amen. And I tell you, I really enjoy this meeting of this... Uh, uh, talking about the Holy Spirit, this has really been uh, a great, great uh, joy to me. Amen. Amen. And devil can't get a hold of this; it's unorganized. So. <laughs> uh, 
a couple of thoughts that had come to my mind. Uh, I think some people, if you ask them if they would like the grace of God, they would all obviously say yes. And I think a lot of people, if you just give them some unmerited favors, they'd like to go through, they'd even go through misery and the rest of their life just to the opportunity to go to heaven. But we might ask ourselves, do we want the grace of God or do we want the God of grace? Now there is uh, something to be thought about there. And I think sometimes the old flesh just wants the grace of God. You know, just give me something. Whereas if you're God-centered, you want the God of grace. Yes. And I think the greatest gift of grace is God Himself. That's the Holy Amen. Spirit in us. Amen. And so that, uh, it just creates a little different uh, action. I think sometimes if I just pray for the graces of God, uh, I tend to feel obligated. You know, I respond and I'm going to be a good guy. I'm going to really... Uh, and first thing you know, it's like paying it back. We just made a little business deal. Whereas, when I seek the God of grace, uh, that attitude seems to turn into such a... Uh, joyful response and trust in all that he has done. And now Brother Gibbon really pointed that out and I want to buttress that from I think his was in Romans, I want to buttress that from Corinthians. Now here Paul dealing with a bunch of people <laughs> that was really more interested in the grace of God than they were the God of grace. He says, I call God as my witness that it was in order to spare you that I did not return to Corinth. Not that we lorded over your faith, but I am working with you for your joy. Because it is by faith that you stand firm. And of course, to the, uh, to the Philippian people, he just hammered and hammered and hammered that on several occasions. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. And he concluded, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you've renewed your concern for me. So that joyful trust is a more appropriate response to this great God of grace. Amen. Amen. Seems the last couple of years we've dealt with some controversial subjects. Last year was the coming of Christ, and you know that there's a lot of controversy among church people about that subject. And you also probably know that probably even more controversy surrounds this topic of the Holy Spirit. And I just want to say a couple of things about about that. That first of all, I'm glad that we're not dealing with controversy here in this meeting. That we're all unified, and and that we're just enjoying the the. Uh, fellowship with one another and hearing about what the scripture says about the Holy Spirit. I, I kind of get tired of controversy after a while and so I, I appreciate that. Um, I've been teaching through 1 Corinthians and on Wednesday nights at my church in Tennessee the last several weeks and I know there's a lot of preachers and teachers that are here and uh, I think in light of the cor corruption of a lot of these truths about the Spirit, uh, what we call the charismatic movement that is becoming so popular today. Um, I think the book of 1 Corinthians, I know for me, has given me a lot of answers, a lot of guidance. And I think the church maybe, I just kind of exhort some of you leaders here, maybe our people need to study the book of 1 Corinthians a little more to get uh, some of the truths about the Holy Spirit out of that instead of going to some movement to get teaching about the Holy Spirit. Um, I had a couple other things I just wanted to touch on. It's very, it's very serious, I think, when we try to attempt to fake the life of the Spirit. Um, I know I just come out of Bible college. I know Brother Jesse's still in Bible college. and I'm afraid that a lot of this is beginning to happen in the younger generation in our search for life our, and for vitality. 
Um, I'm afraid a lot of uh, people are trying to simulate what they believe to be the life of the Spirit. Uh, that is, uh, to me, it's offensive. I know I think it's offensive to God. Um, the life of the Spirit is, is not equal to singing choruses instead of hymns um, and, and other such things. We, should, we shouldn't let those things define what life really is uh, from the Spirit. Um, I'm intrigued by how many places in Scripture uh, the Spirit is equated with life. Um, nobody, uh, that's one subject I think we might be getting in later with some other speakers, but, but you've got the life of the Spirit. The, the Spirit gives life, Jesus said in John 6. And everywhere you look in Scripture, there's, that, that's another way, I think, of the Spirit Himself. You know, we don't know a lot about the Spirit as a person. We know He is a person. Uh, we know about God, and we know the Spirit talks about Christ, but, but one way I think we can, we can think about the Spirit is that the Spirit is life. He's the life of God, and He's imparted to us. And just one other thing, um, I, I especially enjoy the unity of the Spirit. You know what? That's a sure sign that the Spirit isn't there is when there's division, when there's, uh, when there's strife, and when there's gossiping, and when there's all of those things that go along with that that we see so often in the church, that's just a, a sure sign that the Holy Spirit is not there, that the uh, dove has flown the coop, so to speak. So uh, I'm, a, I'm, appreciate, I'm appreciating the unity that is here, that's always here at these renewals, and I hope that in our churches that we can duplicate uh, the unity of the Spirit. Well, Brother Ken Smith is coming forward. I, I, just, I was thinking about that myself. There's... When I came in through these doors here and I, and I saw all these brethren, uh, I thought to myself, there is not a lot that I have in common with them after the flesh. Uh, I don't know a lot of you after the flesh, it, but it is by our spirit. It is by the spirit of God that has overcome these shortcomings of our flesh that, that we are united in Christ. Brother Ken. Just a thought stirred up by Brother Given's comment about our joy in the Lord and rejoicing in hope. Uh, every uh, Thursday night I have an opportunity to meet with a group of men, probably sometimes 30 to 40 men. It's somewhat of a captive audience since they're at the Indiana State Prison, uh, but they, are, they, have, they have the choice of coming to our uh, meeting or going out for recreation. So we have men uh, that uh, have made a choice to come and, and spend some time around the Word of God. Uh, Indiana State Prison is a, a level four, which is a maximum security prison, so most of them that are in there are in there for a long time, and they're in there for some things that we don't ask them what they're in there for. Uh, but uh, I, I wanted to share, I, I, I lead the singing and, and preach there once in a while, and uh, I taught them a chorus that I, we've learned a long time ago, and uh, when I told him that it was scripture, and I pointed out a little, a couple facets of th this verse, they didn't believe it, you know, they was like, well, we're we'll check that out, you know, and so they checked it out, now it's become one of their favorite verses to say to each other and to sing, and I just, I just wanted to share this with you, it's in the context of God telling I've done great things for Zion, and for Tells the daughters of Zion to rejoice because he's overcome their enemy for them. In fact, he says, I, I am in the midst of thee. This is the Lord of grace then. Right? Uh, he said, in that day, this is Zephaniah 3, 16 and 17. In that day it shall be said unto Jerusalem, fear thou not, and to Zion, let not thy hand be slack. Now here's the verse that they love. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save and he will rejoice over you with joy. That was a thought that never occurred to them that God was rejoicing over them. But that's not all. Listen to the rest of what it says here. He, that is God, will rest in his love. And I said, that's why he can read, that's why he joys over you. It's, it's not because of you, it's because of him. But now here, here's the real, the, the number one thing that they like about it. It says, he will joy over you with singing. Now get a picture of that. How, how many of you ever thought about God singing, joying over you with singing? Not when you're singing, but God is singing over us. 
What a thought that is. If, if that doesn't stir our, if we, if we can really see that, really get a hold of that, that God, his love for us is a very active and, to, to use human language, is an animated love for us. God isn't just sitting there saying, well, them kids are doing pretty good, you know. <laughs> I mean, he, he's a cheerleader for us, you know. We, we know, what, what does it say? When one of us repent, what happens in heaven? The whole party. The angels rejoice. And God sings over us. And I just want to encourage you with this fact that God sings over you. He rejoices with you with singing. Sister Becky, I saw your hand. I've been thinking about this uh, new birth, being born from above, um, being born again. And it's been mentioned in this meeting, and, and I thought, um, I think the reason that many of us have not run as swiftly as we should is because we didn't see the power of the endless life, the Holy Spirit that would undergird us, that would carry us through and perform in us that which we couldn't do to cause us to rejoice. We don't muster that up ourselves. When our Lord was born in this life, in the flesh, the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary. I know of people that have said they believe that Jesus was born, but not of a virgin. Well, if I don't believe that, then I would be doubting my own new birth because it was the same Holy Spirit. Amen. And it raised him up through his childhood to endure what he had to do on the cross, it will do the same for us. And if we have not seen that, then we've denied this help, this Holy Spirit that God has promised us and sent a comforter, he's called. And how we have gone along on our one and a half cylinder, if we even had that much going, trying to operate on it, instead of full power. We, we have just... We have just not been dominated and ruled by the Holy Spirit. We have denied that help that God has said he would give us. I pray that I don't let this truth pass from me. I see it so clear today, and I know it, but I do know this other warfare too. Brother Kenny just told us. <laughs> um, do you know how many times the book of John, incidentally, Brother Rick, the book of John is my fa one, of, one of my favorite books, probably the most favorite of the four Gospels. Um, do you know how many times the word if is mentioned just in the 14th and 15th chapters of John? About 19 or 20 times. And uh, uh, Paul says in Romans, if the Spirit, if, that is a, quite a question there, if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead, if, if that Spirit is in you, it'll do the same thing for you that it did for him. It'll Amen. quicken you just like it quickened him. Amen. So um, I was thinking about the love of God being shed abroad in our hearts. Somebody, somebody quoted that verse. But I was thinking about that and I thought, first time I really heard that voice with the hearing of my understanding was about 34 years ago and um, somebody said the quote of that verse, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit and, and I thought you mean you don't get it all at one time it doesn't just the love of God just doesn't drop down all at one time, it just kind of well, it keeps on shedding. It just keeps on shedding because we, we can't fill up. We don't have a big enough space to hold the love of God. So it just keeps spreading and it just keeps spreading until pretty soon it does fill up the whole lump, but it's going to take a whole lifetime for it to do it. But we are raised to walk as a new creature. That is instantaneous. And I thank the Lord for the Holy Spirit that he has the ability to fill up the spot that nothing else can fill in this heart. Amen.
for the mic. I wanted to tie together a few thoughts here that have already been expressed. Uh, like Brother Danny was talking about the, the stars and the things that, that we can see through the Hubble telescope. You know, Solomon said, Shall God indeed dwell in the earth? The heaven of heavens cannot contain him. And as Brother, Brother Kenny ministered to us uh, last night, that the, the gospel is so big, it's so vast, and God's wisdom is so large. You know, we, we think sometimes we know a lot, but and there's other times I sit back and say, man, I don't know anything yet. You know, there's so much more out there. And uh, I, I wanted to tell you something that I've learned. Uh, I want to tell you something that I said one time that was really stupid. And uh, tell you what I've learned from it, so maybe you don't go there. But uh, several years ago, Gene and I lived in Tulsa. That we would come up for a visit. We were uh, over at Brother Fred and Sister Ruby's house, my grandmother and grandfather, visiting with them. And uh, Brother Fred and I were sitting there talking about heaven. I know that's hard to believe, Brother Fred talking about heaven. But, but we were sitting there talking about heaven in my youthful zeal I wanted to wanted him to know that I wanted to get on on the conversation and that I was growing in the Lord and I wanted to impress him with some of my thoughts you know and and I told I'd said you know it'll be wonderful when we get to heaven and we'll finally be there and we'll be known as we are known and we won't need the Holy Spirit to guide us anymore you know and of course you know now that I and like I know that that's pretty stupid and it's not true uh, because uh, the Holy Spirit's ministry of eternal life is not going to stop when we get to heaven. Matter of fact, from one respect, it's just going to get started. Uh, Romans 8.10 tells us that if ye be Christ, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Now Jesus died to make us, make us righteous, and that's for a purpose. That's so that the Holy Spirit could move in. The forgiveness of sins is not an end of itself. The Holy Spirit moves in so we can move up. The Spirit is life. And if we don't have the Spirit, now or then, we don't have life. We are God's because of the Spirit living in us. He's indispensable and absolutely necessary that the Spirit stamps us as God's children. And like Brother Jason said, that, that's why this has come under such attack in our day. Why there's, there's some people that seem to be that's all they talk about is the Holy Spirit. It's distorted and, and things get all out of whack and they're all the way to the other side. People never talk about the Holy Spirit. Well, this, as, as the Lord would say, an enemy hath done this. You know, the, the Spirit is indispensable. And, and He truly, he, he is the minister of eternal life. Second Corinthians five. Verses one through five. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God. A house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so, that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in his tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. The NIV calls it the deposit, this foretaste. Uh, Brother Bill, I believe that was you, uh, Brother Bill Dinwiddie, who uh, mentioned that because it is God's Spirit, He wants us to, to go home with Him as well. Brother Given and I were, were talking about this yesterday, and that is something that has, from the first time I, with uh, the eyes of understanding, as Sister Betty said, uh, first time I read that, with the eyes of understanding, I knew what that meant. 
I groan. My spirit groans to be clothed. It is that foretaste, that deposit, that earnest, that gives you the increased desire to make it homeward. If I, if I may, when, when I was reading about the fruits of the Spirit, and I said, whichever one you feed more, that's the one that's going to win. If you feed that Spirit more, the more you are going to be want, wanting to drive to the goal. The more that you are wanting to go to heaven. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 21. Now he which establishes us with you in Christ and hath anointed us as God. I'm sorry, that's... I'm a little bit off <clears throat> with these. But I want to open this up for a little bit more discussion. If anyone has anything else to add, if not, I'm, I'm going to uh, throw out my final quotes. Brother Bill Parsons. I thank the Lord for uh, ministering to our hearts some precious truths and I thank the Lord for uh, opening our hearts to him and I thank for uh, rookie sin when he says that we minister to my heart <clears throat> the truth and he says uh, it's not good for men to live alone <clears throat> but he reversed that and he says it's not good to live without the Holy Ghost that really ministered to me and I thank the Lord for that it burned in my heart, <clears throat> rejoicing in it. And it was a long, long time ago, <clears throat> before I even knew the Lord, I read this, uh, this scripture. <clears throat> and it says, <clears throat> Whosoever speaketh against the Son of Man, it shall be give, forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, <clears throat> it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, <clears throat> neither in the world to come. And that but it's such a great fright in me. I was by myself at home, and it just tore me up. And I begged God, oh God, forgive me. God thought, not forgiven in this life and the life to come, but God in his infinite wisdom and grace, he sent a preacher in my way and gave me understanding. So God not wished anybody should perish. He wants to save all men everywhere. And he gave us a, such a high priest who became us, who was holy, harmless, undefiled, separated from sinners and made higher than the heavens. He's able to save us to the uttermost, praise God. Amen. Yes, Brother Son. This discussion has been good to depend right straight on the scriptures, and maybe we've covered most of the scriptures about this. I think no one has mentioned Galatians 6. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that sows to the flesh, shall of the flesh reap a grave full of corruption. I added a little a corruption. He that sows to the Spirit shall receive eternal life. Now, that sowing is every choice, every deed, every thought, every, every preference or wish that we have. Take it all to God, exercise in all things, walk by faith, and walk by the Spirit. We, we tend to reserve certain times and certain special key choices for this subject. And the rest of it, we just think we have a right to the human life. The ordinary human life is deadly. Yes. The ordinary human life, we just, when am I going to learn that it's not mine to live? When can I think the body I live in is not mine, but the body of Christ? The life I live is not my life, but the life he gives to me, and I should rejoice in it. He gives us wisdom. This word helps us, this kind of meeting of minds, our ambitions should be but whatever little, bad choices, selfish acts, lazy, selfish, and indulgent attitudes we have, 
are sowing what we're going to reap. Yes, Brother Gavin. Jesse is sharing with us from this 2 Corinthians 5, a very favorite section of mine. And after he's told us that uh, he understands we presently occupy a frail tabernacle fraught with handicaps, weakness, groanings, he tells us that well, when this one is dissolved, we, ha we already have a house. We already have a house made by God it's in heaven waiting for us <clears throat> eternal and then he tells us that while we're in this body we, we groaning not just because we're griping about the circumstances it's because we, have been, we haven't been made for, for this when you were recreated you became a misfit in this body you did. But, uh, but God knew that that was like an intolerable situation. Is attended by a lot of grief and a lot of hardship and a lot of setbacks and a lot of, a lot of confusion. As the scripture says, confusion of face belongs to us. She doesn't belong to God. So he, to, uh, to uh, relieve the situation, he gave us the Holy Spirit. To help us. Here's what he said in his Second Corinthians 5 5. Now he that hath wrought us, that's that's the recreation, the new birth, for the self same thing that's to inhabit that house of heaven. He that hath wrought us for the self same thing is God. <laughs> that's who did this who has also given us the earnest or the down payment of the pledge of the Holy Spirit, he, he gave something from heaven to you here. Hmm? The Holy Spirit came down from heaven. <laughs> it says they preached the gospel with the Holy Spirit sent down from heaven. So here comes the Holy Spirit from heaven where your, te where your temple is waiting for you. It's in heaven. <laughs> and he's orienting you for that so what a what a blessed thing out it's just a blessed thing Amen. just a couple of things um, you don't know how the the comments of the brethren provoke thinking it's I really enjoy this this part whenever I get to hear what everybody here is thinking about but brother Bill said about uh, blaspheming the father and the son and that'll be forgiven you, but not if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit. It, it's, it's not that you're not against God in each of these things, but it's the capacity in which he comes to us in, in your rejection. The Father, he has a purpose and a plan and a will, and you can repent of rejecting that. And Christ has done a great work, and you can repent. But the Spirit, that is... That is personal contact with God himself. You have rejected. It's like you've tasted that the Lord is good and said, I don't want any. It's a personal affront to God that goes so deeply. And if you don't have the Spirit, you're none of His. So if you blaspheme the Spirit, there's, it's like if you fell off a big ship in the middle of the ocean and somebody threw you a life preserver with a rope on it and you said don't you have any red ones up there <laughs> and the ship is passing you on I don't like that rope it's nylon I want a real rope well you, you know you've you've passed up the provision you've denied that which was given you that that you could get hold of and the the spirit this is just, you know, I've thought of these things, but it, it, I love to listen to you talk to it because it just like clears it up a little bit better. The Spirit is the, the communion, the fellowship, the union, the oneness. We've used a lot of words with God himself. And to, now, Brother Michael, I'm not going to call you dumb because <laughs> you're, you're not dumb. 
and you've said a lot of things that have edified many of us here. But as you said that, I, looking at what you said, you know, I could analyze it in the comfort of my pew with having to expose any dumb thoughts I might have had. Uh, that to say that w when we get to heaven, we're going to have no need of the Spirit, which is union with God, and what is heaven, after all, but more union with God and fuller capacity, that's kind of like saying, oh boy, now I'm engaged. I don't have to have anything to do with that guy. <laughs> or going to the, the ceremony and saying, okay, good, I've got a house now. He can live upstairs and I'll live downstairs and maybe we won't even have to see each other. Or, you know, it's just, that's not what you, what you got married for. And that's not why we've come into the fellowship of the Spirit with. It is in order for that closeness, for that personal unity, to know our Creator, to, to know the joy that He wants to know us. And we're conformed because when we see Him, we see that what He is is so much better than what we were. When it first really come home to me, I mean really come home to me, the scripture that says, in me, that is, in my flesh, there dwelleth no good thing. No good thing. Nothing. Not one half of a good thing. Nothing. I was totally effete when it came to goodness. Now, the Spirit, Christ came, and according to the will of God, He cleaned all that up. All the trash and all the garbage made it clean meet for an habitation of for what for a habitation of God so we still go back to the same thing this is he just pounds this thing we're a habitation of God fellowship oneness you can't do that without the spirit and so he God himself dwells in us and we in him through the spirit and because we're dwelling together we become changed. We know him by walking with him. In uh, Micah it says, What doth the Lord require of thee? He hath shown thee, O man, what is good, but to do justice, to love mercy, and this is so gracious, and to walk humbly with your God. With your God. He wants us to walk with him. He's not putting us off apart from himself someplace. He wants us with him. It's so inclusive. And that's really, when we, we taste that the Lord is good, we want that too. And, and we can have boldness. See, a lot of people think, well, that's pretty arrogant. No, it isn't. It's not arrogant for us to, it takes humility for us to receive what God has offered. Because, see, it's not possible unless God accomplished it and we're glorifying the work of Christ. We're actually saying that the work of Christ was perfect and sufficient and worthy of trust and we glorify God by entering in to this provision of salvation and by his grace we enter into it more fully and are conformed day by day as we walk with him and are conformed by the power of the spirit this fellowship of the spirit it conforms us I like what I think it was brother Jean said that you have to resist it you have to vex it, you have to, you have to you actually fight against it, or the Spirit will do His work. He is the greater power. And so the flesh has been written off, and all we need to do is learn to, to see it for what it is. Written off, no value, powerless in, in view of salvation, and just agree with God. And say, Lord, you were right. Anything that militates against it, all of our present day philosophy and everything that says you're really a good person, they're liars. You're not any better than I was. You're just bad in a different way maybe. We got different flavors, but it's all bad. And, and just say, truth, Lord, truth, that I am not what I was. So we repudiate what we were. We, we agree with him and say it wasn't worth anything. It's not what I am now in Christ. And then cleave to the Lord with purpose of heart.
I have the Brother Seth mentioned that do you do what you think Christ wants you to do and leave the consequences to him and I'd really appreciate some of the brethren talking about God's personal leading in our lives when we have a decision to make um, I know a lot of times we can make choices based on the flesh and I realize that we're supposed to um, receive confirmation from God's word according to his leading and through his spirit and through circumstances but sometimes it's hard to trust um, well we can't trust our feelings or our mind and sometimes I don't even know if it's the voice of the Holy Spirit uh, so I would just like some comments on God's personal leading in our lives um, in relation to service for him um, you know God doesn't say in his word move to such and such a place and serve me there uh, and sometimes we have gone to such and such a place and then we think oh we don't think the Lord really led us here um, so I would just like some comments on that Go ahead. yes there are three answers that are very common of course the guidance of the scripture study the scripture and go by the principles of the scripture second the apparent opportunity of fruit for God third uh, the feeling that it's a challenge for me to surrender to not an opportunity for me to be uh, glorified or gratified in myself and uh, fourth is that the brethren that know the situation agree I mean the, the consent of the brethren is an important part of uh, work uh, for order in the church we don't have to have somebody manage everybody but everybody exercise conscientious obedience to Christ according to the gifts of Christ and the opportunities of life with consent of the brethren and if the if others agree with you that's kind of a confirmation that may help and they may not see to go by the scriptures you know the known revelation of God you go by the heart's desire to surrender to him not to make it easy for me the challenge of it sometimes just uh, I feel like it's more the leading spirit to, to say, well, it's something I wouldn't do without the help of the spirit. I mean, um, and see the, the hope of bearing fruit for the Lord. I often tell people that the Christ is the, branch, is the vine, we are the branches. We're not trying to, to mix up some fruit for him. We're trying to yield ourselves so that he bears fruit in us, his fruit in us. If it's a decision of surrender instead of a decision of taking over, see what I mean? It's in the mixture of motives. We can feel some of those motives. You can't just feel the spirit as a special kind of flavor, but <clears throat> you may feel more satisfied that you're accepting the will of God than, than uh, choosing what you would prefer. That mix uh, might help you. Somebody else may have some other idea. There's another element I want to add to that uh, answer, Karen. Uh, uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, I understand from your question, you're not asking about whether I should go grocery shopping or mow the lawn first. You're talking about serious matters that have kingdom implications, family uh, implications, are we going to move? These are, these are big issues. And one of the things that may help, may, I'm not saying this as a, uh, a remedy for everything, but what may help clear the field of any clutter is this issue of presenting your body as a living sacrifice uh, perhaps uh, fasting with your your husband on this matter where there can be two people who are knit with the Lord and they are separating themselves from the indulgence of food so that they can help discern in this matter is this just my lust trying to find a reason I mean there's some things we can do and put a kingdom stamp on it but it's still just pride, arrogance, and all about ourselves and our own ego. 
Um, it's amazing how people, and we, we laugh about it with this phrase, how people are so frequently called by the Lord to a larger salary. And uh, you have to guard that it's not your own heart or even lust and carnal desire that's saying, oh, what I really need is to go to that church of 400 with the salary and the expense account and the two cars. And you, so you have this time of presenting your body as a living sacrifice. That helps to beat down your flesh, to buffet your body, make it your slave, and make sure that it's not some carnal appetite that's trying to exert itself through the back door of what looks like a spiritual decision. The heart is, is deceitful and desperately wicked. Jeremiah 17. Who can know it? I, the Lord, try the reins. So that's why you put yourself in a position where God can help with your mind sort through this and make sure that it's not just of me. I'm not just generating this on my own. And I'm saying this as someone that's put out a lot of resumes in the last uh, 10 years of time and looked at this and thought maybe of that and, and a lot of things even before I entered into the ministry like I am now. And you think, well, that sounds good and I could do this for the Lord. For me, I found that he didn't want me to have a larger salary so I could tithe to him. He wanted me, not just something I can do for him uh, or that. He wanted all of me. And once that's yielded over, then something's cleared up. But uh, again, I say this not by all. And I say this to the younger ones as well. This is not a remedy. Don't think by skipping breakfast suddenly by lunchtime, I've got it. I've got it all worked out. Remember, the Lord founded his ministry on 40 days of temptation and fasting and preparation in that way. I'd like to add one idea that when you have made that choice and undertaking it, if you're devoted to God, he can make that your place. There isn't just some place else that was magic. If you can serve God in one place, you can serve another place. And when you have done that, and you don't get the salary you expected, don't give up. Just continue with that choice. Make good with your choice. And let God enable you. you may, he may purposely give you a testing time. When I turned down a church in Wilkesboro, Pennsylvania once, and did stay on in school, I didn't miss it, but then I got a call to go to Arkansas and try to dig a school that had died out of a hole, and, and I was supposed to get a salary of $1,000 a year. I didn't get any of it that year. But if it was God's choice, I just stayed with it, God's word. He sent a helpers. We didn't suffer any. Uh, make that choice. Don't let some little obstacle in the way make you say, God didn't want me here. If you made the choice for the right reasons, you're not going to read God's will in the circumstances. Amen. This is a, may sound a little simplistic, but it really, it really is not. In the kingdom of God, the Lord directs his people from, from within Christ and within the circumference of uh, God awareness, for you to use kind of a philosophical term, that the closer you get to God, he's able to direct you with his eye yes. as, as you live by faith. Now, there's, a, there's sort of an example of this in, uh, in Acts 16. And a, little, a little play on words here, but it tells you that... Uh, these, uh, these people were pretty close up to Christ. There were some apostles here and holy people. But they, had, they also uh, had to decipher the will of the Lord. They had to feel comfortable in what they did, conscious toward God. Now, I, he said that uh, they went out and they uh, ministered to the churches and uh, established them in the faith and the numbers were increasing. And, and uh, so they, they were, were forbidden, the scripture says they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to, to go into Asia, to preach the word in Asia. He didn't see how he did this. He, he just said, uh, because he, I think the Lord knows that people get caught up in methods and little routines. And you ever been, they, they couldn't get in there, even though they, they tried to go into there. Another place, uh, it said that they, a little later it says they, they essayed or tried to go to Bithynia. Yeah, that must be the place. I had good reasons. See, they had noble reasons for doing this. But they were forbidden by the... The Spirit didn't allow them to do that. <laughs> Again, he doesn't tell you how. But I'm assuming that they were close enough to God to get the signal. Pre precisely how it come across is not, is not the point. They were close enough to God to get this signal. Don't. That's not the place to go. 
And then uh, afterward, they, there was a vision, they saw, saw a vision, Paul had a vision in the night of a man over in Macedonia. Now you got to be alert to God, folks, to, to get a vision from God in the night and know what was going on. And he said he saw a man saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. But now look at what the next verse said. After he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering. They pondered this thing. They, did, they just didn't jump up out of the seat and go. They, they, they were living by faith. They were living by faith. And God's already made a pledge. That, the, that if we cast our care upon him, he'll direct our steps. He's already, that's us casting stone. He embalmed that in print. And so as you, they, they were living by faith. And here's an example of the Lord threw up a barrier here and he threw up a barrier there and he opened up an area here. But it was all discovered by living by, living by faith and close to God. And you can trust that. And then that's what Brother Seth was talking about when he said you, you move when you, when you live and move and have your being to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, you do all to him. You, you cast, the, you cast the, your care upon him and you move out according to your conscience, believing that God will not allow you to step in a mud hole, not if you're living by faith. He'll not allow you to blunder and make some big mistake when you cast in your care upon him. You, you, your faith believes that. And then God will, God will direct you. He will. That one, you know, the subject of money always brings up lively discussion, doesn't it? I have to confess in, in my weakness, sister, that... <clears throat> Sometimes it's, it's easier to see where the spirit isn't than where the spirit is. I don't know why, it just may sound funny to you, but I read an article, not an article, a one ad in the standard here a while back. I was talking to Brother Dave about this earlier. I often look at what the church is, how they apply for preachers when I look for them. One said, we want a man who has a love for the word, people, and preaching and then it said salary commensurate upon education and experience now, my point in that is if a church wants a man to come and to preach to them and you have one man his wife and three children over here and he has a bachelor's degree and man wife and ch three children over here and he has a doctorate and both of them can do the same job the salary is the same now I, I say that from a man who is undereducated in the world's eyes but that is the point and I could look at that ad and I could say the spirits not calling me to go there that's for sure well, there One that with me that goes back like 35 years when I was uh, going to college in, in InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. But that was uh, one of the things that was the, all, you know, the seminar, seminars that everybody gravitated to was getting to know the will of God for my life. That's what they, that's, or the one on marriage, that was the one. But, but anyhow, <laughs> but, but what they talked about was in getting to know the will of God were things like um, what kind of job am I going to have or who should I marry and things like that but you know that uh, that's really not what the will of God is all about I mean that's I mean that's kind of a surface thing if it's about that you know it's that's really tangential see when you talk about the will of God <clears throat> think about things like in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you see and this is the will of God even our sanctification, that we should possess our vessels in sanctification and honor. So, so the will of God is actually that we should live holy. And that we should, that we, see, we're on our way to heaven. That's the will of God. He wants us to come to heaven. See, that's the primary thing. 
That's, the, that's, that's God's prime, according to the will of God and our Father. See, that's what God really wants. So, so if, if we keep the primary things in mind, what, what God's will is, and these other little things just kind of fall into place. Amen. Amen. We need to draw this to a close here. I would just like you to turn back to the uh, verse that we began with, Revelations 22, verse 17. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that hears say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of the book, if any man should add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written under this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book of the prophecy, God shall take away his part of the book of life and of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifies these things says, Surely I come quickly. And here is the end result. The Spirit gets a hold of you and changes you so that we are not slaves to fear, but so that we answer back when the Spirit says, Come, even so, come Lord Jesus. Let's stand for a word of prayer. Lord, Father, and God, we honestly and sincerely thank you. First, that we, uh, that we are yours. And that with others who are yours, we can speak of your things. Dear God, we, uh, we pray that we would be able to live out this discussion in our lives. We ask for your guidance in these matters. We ask for your... Uh, your shaping and your leading. Dear Lord, we pray that you would uh, just form us now while we're in the quarry and fit us for heaven. It's in your son's holy name that we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to reconvene downstairs.